The reading today is from Acts 18. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spoke and taught accurately about the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the word of God more accurately. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. You may be seated. Will you pray with me? Holy Spirit, we need you to work as the word of God is opened and declared this morning. We don't want our time to be fruitless, but we want it to be fruitful. And in order for it to be fruitful, we need the work of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. So Holy Spirit, we would ask you to graciously work in our hearts, convict us, where conviction is needed, comfort us where comfort is needed, change us where change is needed. We submit ourselves to the Lordship of Christ. We put ourselves under the authority of the Word this morning, so Holy Spirit, would you work would you do this for the glory of Christ? It's in his name we pray. Amen. Have you ever tried doing something nice and it just didn't go the way you thought it would? Maybe you were convinced that someone would be blown away by your thoughtfulness and when the time came, the recipient of your kindness hardly acknowledged what you had done. You felt like that child who created something for an adult they admire and love and gave it to them only to have the adult hardly notice, much less acknowledge the gift. Now, maybe something like this has happened to you in the context of a church. You'd been praying that God would lead you to someone who you could encourage. You became convinced that the Holy Spirit had led you to go out of your way to serve a specific person in a very specific way. And you stepped out on faith and you did it. And the one you served acted like they didn't even care. No note of gratitude. No text message in response, not even a simple thank you. Friends, relationships rarely go the way we think they will because all people in our lives are sinners. We're all distracted and we're all selfish. And here's what happens when things don't go the way we expect. Every time we put ourselves out there and things don't go the way we had hoped, we're tempted. We're tempted to retreat from relationships in hopes of avoiding that awful feeling of vulnerability and disappointment. And do you know what I'm talking about? Can you identify with this? This summer, we talked about fostering a culture of discipleship here at Redeemer. And then just two weeks ago, my brother talked about it again. In fact, he said this, if you're a member of Redeemer who's fully committed to God's work through his church, 
and you're faithfully worshiping, ministering, and serving with a sweet spirit, don't forget that there's something more. The next step is discipleship. Committed disciples train new disciples. And brothers and sisters, I know this can be difficult. I know that it can be hard to hear over and over. Be, because for some of you, it's a new way of thinking. Involvement in church for you has been something that's been more passive. You haven't engaged in many meaningful relationships. And now you're being called on to do that. And it's scary. It's unknown. For others, you've tried this. You've tried to invest in others and it just hasn't gone well. My hope this morning is that all of us will see how God is active in the process of discipleship. And that what he has called us to do, he will give us the grace, the wisdom, and the strength to do. So my hope is that this text this morning will spur you forward toward meaningful relationships within the church. I want to draw your attention to three observations about discipleship, and here is the first. Discipleship is driven by the reality of God's providential care. Discipleship is driven by the reality of God's providential care. Let me back up in our text. Back to verses 12 through 17. And I want you to remember what was happening when we concluded our study last week. As Paul declared that Jesus was the Christ, there was a group of Jews that rejected the gospel and reviled Paul. Paul then responded with a pronouncement of judgment and warning, turning away from the Jews and focusing his efforts on the Gentiles yet again. The Lord graciously appeared to Paul in a vision as he again faced opposition and Paul was strengthened by the words of Jesus in verses 9 and 10. I want to remind you of those words. Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. In the midst of uncertainty and fear, Jesus assured his servant of his presence, his protection, and his power. In response, Paul continues ministry in Corinth for another year and a half. But friends, Jesus wasn't simply appearing to Paul in order to give him grace for what he was presently facing. But Jesus was also preparing Paul for what he would be facing. Right, More difficulty, more opposition, and more opportunity for fear. Look with me at verse 12. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. There's a charge that a group of angry Jews are making against Paul, and they bring the charge against him in the presence of the local authorities. And here's the charge. They're claiming that Paul is doing something against the law. But what they were really worried about, and we've seen this already in the book of Acts, these Jewish unbelievers heard the message of Paul. They heard the gospel not as good news, but as an attack on their own religious and cultural identity. Paul and the gospel he proclaimed was a personal threat. How do we know this? Look at verse 14. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If 
it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. This Roman official, Gallio, saw right through the fake outrage of these Jews and he called their bluff. And he essentially said to them, you don't care at all about the law. All you care about is yourselves and your own religious rules. So you're on your own. Get lost. Brothers and sisters, notice how God uses a governmental authority who doesn't appear to have any interest in the things of God. But God uses him to make a decision that frustrates opponents of the gospel and provides safety for followers of Jesus. This is a good reminder that that we should be careful about looking at what's happening in our culture And thinking that the sovereign work of God will in any way be limited if the people we want in office don't get elected. Now, I'm not encouraging ambivalence or some sort of fatalism in regards to meaningful civic involvement. But I am reminding you, brothers and sisters, that God's power is not limited And his work is not thwarted and the spread of his gospel will not be suppressed by any government or any elected official. He is the supreme ruler of heaven and earth and he is sovereign over all things and all people. And this is just one little glimpse of what we've seen a thousand times over and over again. Now, of course, the dismissive response of Gallio didn't sit well with the Jews, so notice verse 17. They all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. This is a vicious group of gospel opponents, and, and we don't want to overlook another episode of violence. But I want to make sure we all see something important here. What's the connection between the words of Jesus in verses 9 and 10 and this episode involving angry Jews, Paul, and a Roman leader named Gallio? I don't want you to miss this. When Jesus makes a promise, he keeps it. When Jesus makes a promise, he keeps it. You never, ever need to doubt Jesus. You never have to wonder if he'll keep his word. He will. This text is just one of an infinite number of examples, all reassuring us that Jesus never fails. When the Lord tells Paul, I am with you, And no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in the city who are my people. He means what he says. The circumstances explained to us in verses 12 through 17 are simply proving to us once again that Jesus does what he says he will do. When Jesus declares that he will be with his children and he'll never leave them, this is the greatest assurance in the universe that God loves and cares for his people. You see, discipleship is driven by the reality of God's providential care. He loves you and he is with you. So get busy. Take risks. Make the most of this life that God has given to you. He's watching over you. So go in boldness. Go in confidence. 
put yourself out there. Maybe it's scary. Maybe you'll be rejected. You're going to feel vulnerable. Maybe it won't go the way you thought it was going to go, but God is caring for you. He's watching over you. Second, I want you to see that discipleship depends on God's sovereign direction. He doesn't just care for you, he's directing you. We see this in verses 18 through 23. Look at verse 18. After this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria and with him Priscilla and Aquila. And at Sincre he had cut his hair for he was under a vow. As Paul continues to move through the region doing gospel ministry, the text tells us that he cut his hair for he was under a vow and it feels like, where, where, what, are the, what does this mean? Where did that come from? So let me quickly explain this to you before we move on to verse 19. Uh, there's a good bit of speculation about exactly what's happening here and why Luke mentions it, but, but here's what I, I think is most likely going on. This incident portrays Paul as a pious Jew living at least in certain respects according to Jewish custom. Making a vow and shaving his head, which may have been in some way connected to God's protection during the situation explained in verse, verses 12 through 17. This was a way of demonstrating his trust in God and probably showing loyalty to the traditions of Israel, all without compromising his gospel message. So we see Paul doing what we've seen Christians doing throughout this book. They're navigating difficulty. As they're trying to reach certain groups of people, they're, they're walking by faith. And here we see an example of, of Paul cutting his hair as part of a vow that he had made and this would have in some way been connected to fruitful ministry amongst Jews, especially in Jerusalem. In other words, friends, Paul had a desire to connect in meaningful ways to the very people he was trying to reach with the gospel. And yet, he would never do anything that would compromise or confuse the gospel. He was committed to preaching. There's a lesson there for us. We've talked about it before, but it's worth thinking about again. Now look at verse 19. And they came to Ephesus, and he left them there, but he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. When he had landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. After spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. So let me give you a couple of observations here. First, notice that even though Paul has had additional run-ins with angry and even violent Jews... And even though we just witnessed in the text a startling scene where Paul turns away from the Jews, pronounces judgment on them for rejecting the gospel, where do we find him again in verse 19? He's reasoning with Jews in a synagogue. No matter how many times he's rejected and reviled, Paul continues to patiently persuade Jews to repent and believe in Christ. Friends, don't give up on those who reject Christ. Keep praying. Keep sharing. Keep loving them. Who knows what God might do? Second, Paul isn't only engaged in making disciples, but also maturing disciples. 
Look at verse 23 again. After spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Paul isn't solely focused on evangelism, but also discipleship. He desperately wants to see new Christians, but he also wants to see growing Christians. Redeemer family, this is our desire as well, isn't it? We don't want our sole focus to be on making disciples, but we also want to mature disciples. And of course, the reverse of that is true as well. We don't want to solely focus on maturing disciples to the neglect of sharing Christ with those who haven't yet turned in him by repentance and faith. Now, there's a third and final observation before moving on. In verses 19 through 23, there are a number of geographical locations mentioned. And if we're not careful, we could skim right past a very important phrase. A phrase that highlights a truth that should change the way we read verses 19 through 23 and should change the way we understand the ministry of Paul and it should deeply challenge all of us. Look at verse 21. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. Now, Paul is not simply affirming the sovereignty of God as a kind of disconnected theological reality. This is not a throwaway line. He is affirming God's active direction of his life and his desire to be sensitive and obedient to God's active direction of his life. There's so much that could be said about the whole topic of God's will here, but I'll save that for another time. Here's here's what I do want you to grasp this morning. Paul's statement in verse 21 affirms the sovereignty of God, but it also affirms the lordship of Christ. Here's what I mean. Paul does not view his life as his own. He belongs to Jesus. And therefore, Jesus' plans for his life are infinitely more important than his own plans. Brothers and sisters, we need to recover the reality that to be purchased by Jesus doesn't simply have implications for the future, but also for the present. In fact, listen to how Paul explains this when writing to the Ephesian believers. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages, future, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, present, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God has radically saved you, brothers and sisters, to live under the lordship of Jesus Christ right now. His plans should matter more to you than your own plans. This is something that should shape the way you think and live on a daily basis. Consciously living under the lordship of Jesus Christ, in glad submission to the word of God, This is what it looks like to be in the will of God. Brothers and sisters, again, your life and your plans are not your own. You belong to Jesus at your job, as a parent, in your suffering, 
God's plans must be your plans. Paul's primary concern in life was to carry out the will of God. And on a daily basis, this is what that meant. Submit to the Lordship of Jesus. Live as his joyful subject by gladly walking in obedience to his word and constantly praying for the Holy Spirit's wisdom and guidance. Friends, if we live this way, I think we would be surprised. I think we would be surprised at how often God used us in unexpected ways. If we woke up every day recommitting ourselves to King Jesus, submitting our plans and desires to his will, right? Here's my list for today, Jesus. But I'm yours, so rewrite it however you want to. I think we would be shocked by how often we would find ourselves in situations and circumstances where God used us for his glory and the good of others. In other words, God may have more for you, but you're being blinded by your own plans. Discipleship is driven by the reality of God's providential care. Discipleship depends on God's sovereign direction. He'll take you to the places and to the people where he wants you to invest. I believe God's will for your life, his sovereign direction will be understood more clearly and experience more fully as you live under the lordship of Jesus. But now a third observation about discipleship, and with this we switch gears a little bit, and we'll close with this as well. So discipleship is driven by the reality of God's providential care. Discipleship depends on God's sovereign direction. But then when he leads you, to the people and to the place, discipleship requires wisdom and grace. Okay? Discipleship requires wisdom and grace. We see this in the text that was read earlier, verses 24 through 28. This might be the most practically instructive scene we've encountered since the description of the early church in chapter 2. Look, look with me at verse 24. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. We're introduced to someone who shows up for the first time here in the New Testament, but This won't be the last. His name is Apollos. And and notice what the text says about him. It's a remarkable description. He's a gifted speaker who knows the Bible really well. He's also been instructed in the gospel. He knows Jesus is the way to God. He's fervent in, a better translation might be, in the spirit. And he's passionately presenting the truth concerning Jesus. Again, this is, this is a remarkable description of a pretty incredible servant of Jesus. But there's a problem. There's a problem. The text says he knew only about the baptism of John. What on earth does this mean? Well, it simply means that Apollos knew about John's baptism, but somehow didn't know what John's baptism pointed to. Apollos apparently didn't know about the new covenant baptism practice that Jesus established. He didn't know that in Christian baptism, 
The triune God places his name on his people. So he wasn't teaching that baptism is a means of vividly illustrating a believer's union with Christ in his death and resurrection. Apollos understood, believed, and preached the gospel of Christ, but he knew nothing of this ordinance in which the use of water preaches the gospel. Apollos lived in a unique historical situation that caused him to need some clarification on this point. Friends, Apollos was a really gifted guy who loved Jesus and he wanted to serve him, but he needed help. So look at verse 26. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Isn't this wonderful? This is so important for us to consider when situations like this occur. There 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 are often two mistakes that are made. Uh, The first mistake is this. Some believers, when they see a newer or less mature Christian who's getting something wrong, they're unwilling to step up and invest for fear that something might go wrong. Excuses are made. It's not that big of a deal. They won't listen to me. I don't have the relationship. It'll be fine. It's not that big of a deal. But what happens is the person in need of help doesn't get it. Because the person who could help is unwilling. Here's the second mistake. Some believers who could be gracious and helpful... They know their Bibles really well. They would rather play the role of a theological watchdog. Always on the prowl for someone who's not getting everything exactly correct. And and boy, when, when they see or hear something that's off, they begin to bark. And instead of graciously coming alongside someone whose desire is to exalt Jesus... They crush them. Friends, in Priscilla and Aquila, we have a wonderful example of two mature Christians who see an opportunity for discipleship and they step up. And with grace and kindness, they help instead of hinder. And And what what does this kind of discipleship lead to? More faithful and more fruitful ministry. Look at verse 27. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped Those who through grace had believed. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. Do you see this chain of discipleship? Somewhere Apollos heard the gospel and he was trained well in the scriptures, but there was a gap. And so when Apollos is then ministering to others, Priscilla and Aquila go, oh, oh. That's not right. Let's let's pull him aside. We we appreciate his passion for the gospel. We recognize that he's really gifted, but he's 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 got to get this right. So they pull him aside and they gently correct him. They fill in the gaps. They connect the dots. And then how does God use Apollos? To greatly help those who through grace had believed. 
So along comes this guy named Apollos. Again, he's gifted by God and passionate about the gospel, but his usefulness was limited by his incomplete understanding of Scripture. But then a sweet and godly couple, not nearly as gifted as Apollos, but with a heart for discipleship and a willingness to be used by God however he chose, they had a profound influence on Apollos. And by having a profound influence on Apollos, they made a tremendous kingdom impact. So, I know there are Priscilla's and Aquila's in this congregation. And guess what? I also know there are Apollos's. God has you here in a faith family together. And this is just one illustration. But he wants to bring the two of you together for mutual edification and for greater fruitfulness in ministry. But if you're Priscilla and Aquila, you've, you've got to be willing to put yourself out there and to do it with the right spirit. And if you're Apollos, understand that you don't have it all figured out. And when God leads a more mature believer into your life, shut up. And listen, God is sovereignly directing all of this for your good. Here's what I love about our text today, and let me try to bring this all together. When the people of God are engaged in the work of God, they experience the providential care of God. Jesus is with his people in fact, D.A. Carson talks about this promise made in the Great Commission. And he says, I don't, I don't want to say it's contingent upon obedience to the Great Commission, but it's tied to obedience. So do you want to experience the closeness of Jesus? The reality of this promise? Get busy. Get engaged in discipleship. But there's more. When the people of God are submitted to the lordship of Christ, embracing his plan and purpose, they will be sovereignly directed by God to the right people in the right places at the right time. But there's even more. In the good and perfect plan of God, he will use each of his people in unexpected ways to encourage and disciple others. And God will be glorified in this. And the church will be strengthened. And sinners will be rescued by God's grace. Brothers and sisters, as you walk through your days, wanting to glorify God and be used by him. Remember the promised presence of Jesus. Submit to the lordship of Jesus and be ready and willing to help somebody else follow Jesus. Let's pray.